minutes. Good evening. My name is Marietje Schaka. I'm a member of the European Parliament for the Dutch Democratic Party in the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. I serve on the committees on foreign affairs, international trade and on culture, media, youth, education and sports. But the role that technologies play and the impact they have on our daily lives, rights, freedoms are a central theme in my work. I'm really sorry I cannot join you in Berlin today, but I'm happy to share some of my thoughts via video. Despite the US federal government shutdown, a negotiating team from the US traveled to Brussels on Sunday for the second round of negotiations on the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP, a trade deal between the two largest trade blocs in the world that is initiated to benefit our economies, boost growth and jobs, and would set new standards for the future of global trade. Both the US and the EU have offensive and defensive interests, and the challenge will be to balance those or to negotiate a good deal. And aside from that, work on mechanisms that could result in a better regulatory coherence. Think about standards for car safety belts or tests of pharmaceuticals, standards for financial services or new technologies like nanotechnologies or medical equipments. The scope of TTIP is of an unprecedented scale. In principle, I believe this deal should benefit the EU and the, in, and the US individually, but also our historically close partnership, while the world around us is rapidly changing. But given the recent NSA revelations, many in Europe are concerned about trust in this partnership. And this I fully understand. Those concerns are very legitimate, and we need more answers to many of our very important questions that we've put to our US counterparts. However, I don't believe that we should freeze the negotiations on TTIP at this point because eventually that would not be in the EU's interest. Instead, we should stand firm for what we believe in and build that into the agreement. After all, a lot of trade and investment is not sensitive at all and that will not stop from one day to another. But clearly, TTIP should not be used for the US and the EU to agree on new levels of data protection and cross-border data flows. This is simply too sensitive at this moment, also because the EU itself is still working on legislation. So there need to be specific measures protecting the rights of EU citizens negotiated with that specific goal in mind. We have interesting experiences when it comes to treaties and their impact on digital freedoms. Many of you may still remember the fight against ACTA, the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, which I prominently led here in the European Parliament. The ACTA agreement would have seriously threatened and could harm the global and open internet as we know it. So luckily, and also with the help of thousands of internet users, online and offline, we convinced a majority of my colleagues and politicians in European member states that ACTA was not the way to go forward. And now, many who feared ACTA at the time were worried about the Commission trying to sneak in similar provisions in TTIP. And I don't think that that's the case, and at least I'll make sure that it won't be in the future either. The Commission has been very outspoken and clear that it will not include ACTA-like provisions in TTIP. The Commissioner himself told me he's not a masochist. And TTIP is too important for the EU and the US economies it would add 120 billion to the EU's economy structurally and to jeopardize the Parliament's required approval by including provisions that would harm the open internet would actually put the whole treaty at stake. Now finally, I also believe that TTIP should be transparently negotiated and carried and supported among citizens. That is why I'm providing as much information as I can on my own website. And I'm pushing the European Commission to engage with stakeholders and civil society regularly and seriously in order to make sure that TTIP is an agreement not only benefiting CEOs but actually people just like you and I. Indeed, in our globally connected world, trade agreements are no longer negotiated in a vacuum. Their impact can be felt the world over. So we should also use the opportunities of technologies to involve citizens in order for us to do our work better that eventually benefits everyone. Thank you very much. I look forward to continuing our conversation online. 
Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, now we go directly to the panel discussion. Um, besides Glenn Moody, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Stefan Heumann, uh, Joachim Bühler, um, Josef Brammel, Stormy Annika Miltner, and Thomas Rudy. And uh, we provided you with um, short um, bias of uh, our panelists. And additionally, I would like to welcome my colleague uh, Miguel Verde Garrido, who will uh, lead to the moderation uh, or will lead to the um, panel um, together with me. Um, so since we have like different topics to discuss, um, I would recommend that we keep the answers as brief as possible and as long as necessary. First of all, um, we will ask different top topics uh, to cover the several dimensions of TTIP and later on um, we open it up to the auditorium to have a Q&A session. So to get started, um, I would like to address uh, the topic of uh, TTIP and the government shutdown or the current euro crisis. Um, so this question is especially dedicated um, to Mr. Brammel and uh, Ms. Mildner. Um, the question is initially it was intended that the second round of TTIP negotiations should start this week. However, on short notice, um, the high-level meeting was cancelled due to the current government shutdown and ongoing political disputes in the US. At the same time, Europe is still affected by the Euro crisis and suffers from a growing discrep discrepancy in between the North and the South. So the question is, how, much, how may such internal factors affect the negotiations? <laughs> as, as you just said, um, uh, I mean, negotiations take place between the governments and if one of the governments is shut down then the negotiations can take place and if you look at uh, websites of the USTR which is uh, the trade negotiating office in the United States then you see that the, uh, the the web pages are also shut down so there are just no negotiators right now I would say this is um, this is in um, on one hand side um, a bad thing but not not, not necessarily a really bad thing because on one hand side there was the goal to conclude these no negotiations within a time frame of three years. This is overly ambitious anyways and um, I wouldn't have expected it um, to be concluded in three years anyway. So um, a week or two prolonged negotiations because of the shutdown won't be a problem anyways. Um, on the other hand, um, I would say it gives us more time also in stakeholder dialogues to um, talk about these issues and get some more clarity into the topic. And I think um, that a um, meeting like this is a really good place to start. I heard several times today that there's a lack of transparency and a lack of knowledge. Um, so far, I've got the feeling that we have I mean, so far today, not really gotten into a lot of substance um, on these issues. And as you said, trade, trade agreements, trade negotiations are awfully complex and very technical. And I think it would be worth to explain a little bit more, more into depth and detail what is really being negotiated and what it really means um, for every individual um, one of us. So um, why not delay it a little bit and talk a bit about more? So th that's why I said it's, it's not necessarily so bad. Your turn. I'm, 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 I'm not an expert on the Euro crisis, but I, when I can sleep at night, I try to figure out domestic determinants of US foreign policy. And even before this president has been re-elected, I uh, made a clear thesis uh, pointing out it doesn't matter who is going to be elected in the White House for us here in Germany. It makes all the difference for Americans. For those people who cannot feed their children, it makes all the difference. But not in terms of foreign policy, and here I mean uh, security policy, trade policy, economic policy, and especially uh, environmental and yeah, energy foreign policy. Romney and Obama would have had the same problem that would have been blocked, except for security policy. Here, the commander-in-chief can do almost everything he or she wants. Maybe we have a woman one day. But in all the other aspects, my uh, point was uh, either Romney would have been blocked by the Senate or vice versa, Obama would have been blocked for another four years by the House. He has two years until the next elections, and after that, he's a lame duck. So 
I'm not that afraid, sir. I mean, uh, I like your presentation a lot, but I have two different assumptions. One is the American system of checks and balance doesn't function any longer, therefore we won't see a trade deal that's worth that name you saw on that. People were talking about a low-hanging fruit. Guys, this fruit has been hanging around for decades since Kinkle first introduced that idea. What's different today? You have another different assumption, sir, about the interest groups. They're not on the same sheet. That's why we won't see it happening. The problem is you cannot smooth out every difference. The car industry has learned they talk together, they work it out before it goes to the governmental level. But you better talk to the farm lobby and all those other guys. And then you haven't talked to the sub-national level. So prediction one is Obama won't receive trade promotion authority. That's something he would need so he can take this package up to Capitol Hill and then they can vote it up or down. And they might want to see what's in there. So again, here I have a slight different view. I think Congress is very keen on really knowing the details and they will flush it out in public. That's how Congress works. I've been a member of a, a congressman, a congressional staff. They really want to feed their interest groups so they can kill a bill or, or, or push it forward. So prediction one is uh, Obama won't get TPA, not because of those bad Republicans, but because of his own fellow Democratic uh, congressmen uh, close to the unions. He would need moderate Republicans. Uh, uh, do you still know of any moderate Republicans? But yes, they are still out there, but they won't do him the favor to really give him a bipartisan deal. They would have a chance now with the government shutdown, and I'm afraid they, they are afraid. And the other thesis I have, Obama has difficulty on the state, on the national level, and the worst problem is he cannot really govern the individual states. When you talk about Buy America provisions, and we have a constitutional lawyer here or a constitutional expert who knows about the theory of, 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 of you know, how, how uh, structures evolve. And you, you should cer interested, yeah? <laughs> certainly know about the U.S. Constitution and how it has been worked out through civil wars and all we have. And there's one thing for sure. The states do whatever they want on that level, and so no president uh, can really tell them don't buy American. So two huge obstacles uh, which may lead to a less problematic situation. So we will at one point uh, run out of acronyms to really have those ideas enacted. Uh, uh, a positive view is they may really boil it down to a very low level and, and pass something because they really talked about a geopolitical thing and this and that you hear. So they will have some success, but it's not worth the name it's written on. America is really interested in trade, but not with Europe any longer. Here we are on a high level already. They are, if they are interested in this Trans-Pacific deal, and here the president has also been absent and China has been running the show. So uh, think more about America's interests in Asia, transatlantic, I say, that's something we have been pushing hard to make Obama say that in the State of the Union. I had, uh, that's my last sentence, uh, the honor to talk to a few industrialists before they took their special seats in front of Obama. And I said, guys, forget about it. You are all excited about it. And they were really disappointed because Obama didn't really mention it. This uh, TTIP thing, I mean, he passed it slightly. And those folks were really disappointed. I think that statement fits quite well with the next question, which is also dedicated to YouTube because we are so uh, staying in one certain block. We move on to the to the issue of TTIP and geopolitics, or rather geoeconomics. Um, many critics argue that TTIP is about everything but trade in a world that is now signified by a global shift of power and the so-called rise of the rest. So how could you describe the geopolitical or more precisely geoeconomic relevance of TTIP also taking into account that what you meant, just mentioned, that the U.S. simultaneously negotiates, uh, negotiates another agreement, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, which is on the one hand to exclude China, and uh, at the same time we have uh, the EU streng strengthening ties with Canada by means of uh, CETA, so there's kind of like a whole connection growing. And just as a small follow-up question, would you say that TTIP will create a more unified or rather divided world? 
So that's again to you too. <laughs> to make my thesis clear again, it won't happen. Therefore, it won't divide the world. Okay. It it won't happen in substance. Yeah. Well, um, first first of all, maybe one word, a couple of words on the Euro crisis as well, because we didn't answer your question, right? Um, and. Um, the uh, the EU EU member states are very different, right, um, in their economic structures, um, and we do have huge inequalities between um, EU member states as as well as between EU member states, um, and. Some countries are more trade-oriented, like we are, um, although I also have to say that we trade mainly among ourselves. EU member countries trade about 60% of their trade among ourselves and not with third countries. Um, but some are more trade-oriented and some are more domestic market-oriented. So the effects of a TTIP on different EU member states will be very different. And here again, it depends very much on how the agreement is going to look like in the end, who is going to benefit more than others. Um, because it is obvious any kind of trade agreement and trade liberalization um, a lot of times it leads to an increase um, of welfare overall on a macroeconomic level, but there are always distributional effects on a national level and between states as well. Um, and so it depends on very much um, how, how the agreement is going to look like, um, which countries are going to benefit. And this is one of the worries within the EU, is that the um, disparities between the EU member states might increase even further through such an agreement. Um, and I think one of the uh, things we need to be careful of is that the agreement is going to benefit um, all EU member states and not just individual ones. Um, so that's, that's on, on the EU and the EU uh, crisis. Um, with regard to, uh, you mentioned so many questions, it's a bit uh, difficult to answer yeah, all, so. Economic answer. Well, I think it's, it's, in, it's fueled um, in parts by fears um, uh, of losing the position we currently still have. Um, and uh, if, if, you, if you look at our, um, I mean, percent sh share of global trade um, in services and goods, share in global GDP, share in investment, um, uh, share in mergers and acquisitions and so on, you see that the percentage is um, decreasing over time. Um, so it is, in, in a sense, an answer um, to, to this development which has taken place over the last 20 years because the assumption is that um, if we get together, liberalize trade, increase welfare, um, increase our potential to grow, um, we, will, um, we will counter this development. Plus, um, the negotiators hope that by pooling um, the power, they will also be able to set standards globally vis-a-vis um, -vis those emerging powers, which also have um, expectations or um, know how they would like to see global standards look like. Um, so because we are, we are in, a, in a lot of senses more similar, EU and US in many aspects, more similar than the EU and China or the US and China, um, there is the hope that together we could set standards while alone we cannot set standards. I would not say that this is a, a project which is meant um, to be um, like a fortress. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of talk about having an open trade agreement, being open to including um, the NAFTA partners, Canada and Mexico, open regionalism, so to say. So it's not meant like a uh, uh, Steingart uh, global, I mean, U.S. fortress. Um, how, however, we need to be very careful that it doesn't appear like this and become as such by certain standards we set. So there is a lot of, uh, I mean, like, management to do that this, this, these negotiations and the agreement in the end is going to help the multilateral trading system and not going to hurt it. Um, Mark in his question previously mentioned um, geoeconomics and global politics and um, as Mr. Moody pointed out with the investor state dispute settlement, um, perhaps one of the key players now in, in geoeconomics are corporations. Um, the recently expired Farmer Assurance provision, which we know as the Monsanto Protection Act, is um, considered by many an example of the growing power of corporations over states and their legislations. Um, the New York Times recently reported um, through documents released in error by the European Commission that before the TTIP negotiations started, EU officials consulted businesses, 
on both sides of the Atlantic on how to structure the free trade agreement. And these documents also noted that the business community expressed their desire not only to have an active role in settling the agenda, but also in writing new regulations. Um, so the question is for Mr. Buller and whoever else wishes to um, answer it. Um, why are businesses so privileged um, and involved more than stakeholders in, in these processes? And isn't this perhaps an example of the logic of collective action where the few will benefit while the many will remain disadvantaged? Well, it's a question to me. I, I, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> well, a good question. Well, before I came here, I thought I'm, I'm a little bit talking about the topics for the internet industry in Germany and um, what, what is the internet, what is the digital economy says to this TTIP thing. But um, we also have some experiences with, uh, so some, with some kind of treatments. Um, I just mentioned the ACTA thing. And uh, I think we can learn from ACTA that this should not happen again so that we have to have a more transparent way of dealing or f f a more transparent way to, to get to this street agreement in here. Um, but, um, but before that, we, we, we have to make another point, and that's what I wanted first to say. Well, Bitcoin, or the, the digital economy in Germany, just welcomes these street agreement. We, we think there's a lot of things to do, and uh, the, the ICT market in the EU and uh, in the US is still the biggest ICT market in the world. So we are talking about a very, very huge market. And well, you're right, the BRIC states, for example, are very important for us as well. But still, if we talk about startups here in Berlin, I just came from Berlin, from the Nazverwaltung von Wirtschaft, and they are talking about what can we do for startups here in Berlin. And um, the role model is not China or it's not uh, Brazil or whatever. It's still the U.S. It's still Silicon Valley we were talking about. And so um, the U.S. market is very, very important for the Europe ICT industry. It's very important for the German ICT industry. And, and this is the, the first point I wanted to make. If we want to have a trade agreement with the U.S., we don't want to have a trade agreement for the 19th or 21st century. We are living in the 21st century in the digital age. And, uh, we, and, and, and our apprehense is that digital topics are not discussed in this treaty agreement. There is no, nothing about, the, for example, data protection. There's nothing about the new, new industries, nothing about startups and all these things. And this is a very big problem because if we want to, 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 yeah, if we want to, have to create welfare and if we want to take everybody with this thing, then why, why only talk about um, like cars and you know all these things from the last century. We need to have no new perspectives, and we need to discuss even this um, data protection thing. Well, well, we made our our position before the NSA debate, but uh, I still believe it's very important to discuss about it. Otherwise, it won't work. Certainly. Angle. Reminded me of this discussion. I mean, that's outdated about iron triangles. But I think we, we see an iron triangle here again. I mean, iron triangle is you have a connection not only in, in the European Union, but especially in the US about special interests and uh, policy makers, congressmen, and their staff, special committees who are in charge, and government bureaucrats. And they have vested interests that go back and forth. Now people say those iron triangles don't exist any longer. We have now issue networks. Think tanks are chipping in, and those who buy them are a few guys who even make a grassroots movement cultivation, like the Koch brothers. You know, they and, and, and uh, they buy newspapers. So we talk about issue networks now, but the idea is still the same. And here, apply to this current situation. You even see a president unable to makes the government more efficient. Obama's idea was to really put a few agencies together, the USTR, US Trade Representative with the uh, Commerce Department and a few others, to really streamline it. And my prediction is it's not going to happen. He will fail like every other president before him. Even Reagan failed to uh, slim down uh, this because there are stakeholders everywhere. So you will see customers not really benefiting. But here I have a slightly different view. I think many regulations are not in place to protect consumers, but to protect special interests on both sides of the Atlantic. I mean, me being an ex-farmer, I don't see really that 
those uh, farm interests that are protected by EU structures are really for the benefit of all of us. Maybe I say that because I'm not a farmer any longer, but still engaged in bullshit. But anyway, those things are not just introduced by governments. And when you talk with in industry guys, I mean, they say, oh, governments on both sides will really have to work it out so those regulations go away. Those regulations wouldn't be there if there weren't interests who cover their markets. So we won't see more trade liberalization in the future, but I see the opposite. We are entering times of protectionism. And that's why we actually do this. We see that coming, and now we try to leapfrog and, and and, and, and make the low-hanging fruits really, really come down, but I don't see them coming down. I see a, a period where we see much more protectionism coming out, especially of the U.S. legislature, of individual states, and uh, maybe there is much more protectionism coming from Europe, from France, cultural exception and that stuff, but that's where I'm not an expert on. On that note of um, protectionism, vested interests, lobbying efforts, um, the question and answer section of the, on TTIP at the European Commission's website explains that the supposed need for secrecy of the negotiations um, is an explanation I think that would be appropriate for a child that um, negotiations are like a card game in which cards should not be shown. However, um, in view of recent leaks that indicate that both the NSA and the GCHQ spy on EU institutions, um, my question is, who is the EU hiding its cards from? Is it its citizens who cannot be better informed and more transparently informed? Um, because it would seem that the US, with the UK's help, already knows what cards the EU is, is holding, as you pointed out before, Mr. Moody. Um, my question then for Mr. Hoyman, Mr. Um, Rudy, and, and Mr. Moody is, shouldn't civil society, which often possesses expert knowledge that can um, benefit government's attempts at legislation on, on rapidly developing technologies be involved more, um, and shouldn't their concerns and voices be heard more clearly? Okay, if, if, if I may start, because I think that's a very important question and exactly the right one, because I think that the revelations about the NSA and also, in part, uh, GICQ and, and BND, our, our German intelligence service, have clearly shown, um, I mean, there's there's always been speculation how much um, surveillance is, is going on on the Internet, but now we have uh, documents and evidence that the scope and scale is, mu is much bigger than we have anticipated, and we have never had a public debate on this. And, and um, to Mr. Snowden's credit, he has um, initiated that debate, and it's a very important one. And um, what what the problem uh, for um, for the, for the European civil society at the moment is that is uh, most of the finger pointing is going across the Atlantic towards the NSA, and um, I thought too that um, probably that the that the legal framework or that the NSA was was kind of out of control, but uh, we have so so what we did is we looked and compared the legal frameworks for NSA. Um, GCHQ in, in Britain and um, BND in Germany, and what we found is that the, the to boil it down and not going into too much details, that the basic problem persists everywhere. That the governments have legal frameworks in place that try to protect their own citizens from extensive surveillance and kind of weed them out if their um, um, communications get swept up. To you know, and, and there's even debatable how well that works at all, but at least there are some attempts to do that. And for foreigners, it's it's fair game. And so we in Europe want to say and 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 say that what the NSA does is is unacceptable to us. Um, and I think to be credible, uh, we should go and establish higher standards um, and and start um, um, talking about um, 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 our G10 law and um, parliamentary oversight in Germany and how that's failing. And in the UK, the situation is even worse because we have only the executive branch reviewing requests for surveillance, so there's no checks and balances at all. So um, I think that's also the problem why the response of the EU has been so weak towards the United States, because you have actually the UK um, cooperating very closely with the NSA and the UK blocking attempts within um, the EU for, for a stronger response. So I think the EU even ha hasn't figured out its own position on this. Even in the, we have the problem even within the EU that um, 
um, the Brit Britain is spying on Germans, and, and Germans can the BND can spy on the French and all that. We don't have any no spy within the EU. I think if we want to if we want to start a, a debate and say that European Union um, has a strong reputation of finding international norms and agreements, here's a chance for the EU to set the example to say we are going to find a standard to protect our citizens better, and then try to expand that outward. But the problem I see at, at the moment is that we don't even have this on the German level sufficiently, we don't have it on the EU level sufficiently, and I think those are the first necessary steps before we then even can talk about an international agreement and talking to our American friends and saying um, this is unacceptable and, and you need to adopt um, higher standards. And, and civil society has, really has to put the pressure on the, on the parliaments. This is the role of the parliaments to control, I mean, especially in Germany. It's not, you know, it's really the, the parliamentary oversight. It's calling our upcoordinate and our, our representatives and telling them this is not working and, and, and you guys need to do better and you need to have a reform. And I don't really see from the party and the, from the government level this happening. So civil society has, we have to stand up for that. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, that would be a, a very good idea, and in, in my paper I arrived at a similar conclusion. Um, there's also the question of more general data protection, and it looks as if we actually might get, before the end of the legislator, leg, legislative period uh, in the European Parliament, uh, a new uh, regulation on data protection for the European Union. Then they would be the same in all the member states. Uh, that would and that would be not exactly what you're asking for, but it would be a step in the right direction. Uh, but this, uh, Joachim, you mentioned something before that you thought that uh, data protection should be put in the, the TTIP, and I'm not so sure that that's a good idea. There might be some aspects, but we still want to maintain the the main regulation on data protection uh, separately from the, the trade agreement. There's no really reason to subsume data protection under under a trade agreement. Uh, Thierry's going away now, but uh, Glenn Moody also raised the point that uh, the United States has more to gain from TTIP than uh, the European Union. This was this is actually not what what I what I think you were saying. But um, if the United States does indeed have more to gain from uh, concluding successfully the TTIP negotiations, then it would be a good opportunity for the European Union to say we should successfully conclude the general framework agreement on data protection before we proceed with further negotiations like TTIP. This would be, if, if indeed the EU is in a better negotiating position, uh, a good opportunity to apply more leverage and the negotiations on data protection between the United States and the European Union will be going on now for two years, since 2000, 2000 well, three years now, 2010, uh, and they're, 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 they're deadlocked right now, unfortunately. Um, as was said in, in, in Warsaw, the, um, there's a recent, recent meeting on data protection in Warsaw, of the, the world's um, uh, data protection supervisors and a civil society side event to that, and it was thought there, too, that um, it would be good to conclude those, those negotiations on, on, data, on data protection. So I think that could be made into a a condition for uh, con concluding for, for continuing the TTIP negotiations instead of trying to subsume data protection under trade policy. If okay. go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, we have the same debate in our, uh, the, the debate in our association. We were talking about uh, whether we should assume data protection under this TTIP thing or not, and we had another debate about assuming. Um, as well topics that are not clearly or not obviously trade issues if we should assume it under the trade under the TTP as well and I want to make an example we also have to talk about the internet, gov internet governance thing and we had a big debate whether to put it in the TTIP discussion or not but from our perspective that's what that's what I mentioned or what the, that's that's what I wanted to point it out with the, with the, the TTIP is not made for the digital agenda it's not made for the digital age it's still talking about in these little, you know, question we say in Germany. Yeah, it's just only one point, and this is trade, and this is, you know, there we have the the the, the car industry, and there we have the farmers, and all this stuff. 
But uh, the, the, the new thing about internet is that everything is connected and you can't, you just can't separate it. You can't say data protection is not a trade issue. It is, definitely. It's one of the main business models of a lot of startups here in Berlin. And it's a very big uh, business issue for, for a lot of startups in Silicon Valley as well. So, and, and the internet governance things, like whether we have, want to have a free internet, whether we want to have an internet with, based on capitalism, where we have a, a multi-stakeholder internet, and not a concentrated internet by, uh, controlled by governments. Let, please, this, after NSA debate, you know, just keep this a little bit out of it. But we had this discussion in Dubai for, for the internet uh, governance thing. And there was the US and European Union, you know, they were fighting for the free internet, for a multi-stakeholder internet. And I think it's very important to, in a connected world, we can't say these internet things, just leave it out. And, and you know, we have to discuss it in this context. And it's very important. Otherwise, we, um, where should we find a solution for it? Where, I mean, where's the place to discuss it? Uh, this is a very good, this is a very good um, time, is a very good time slot to discuss these things. I don't know. I don't what know. What about the International Telecommunications Union? Are you dissatisfied with the ITU negotiations? That was too fast. I'm sorry, my English net is so good. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU. Yeah, this is. You yeah. were in Dubai. Yeah. Okay. This is this is a very good place, but. You know, um, <laughs> if you want, well, you, you can discuss it, but, well, you need the big guys for it. I mean, these are big issues. This is what we, uh, yeah, this is our, 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 our story that we tell um, from the ICT industry. I mean, if the ICT thing is the next industrial revolution, then everything will change. And then you can't just separate it in a BCC conference where we have to discuss it with Obama and all these things. Then the European Union has to discuss it. And we really appreciate that the EU, EU um, uh, next, the high level meeting on uh, 24th and 25th October is discussing the digital agenda for, for the first time. For the first time, we are talking about millions of jobs in, in, in the European Union. We are talking about that internet change everything, and the European Union is discussing it the first time. And uh, so that's why we say, yes, we have to discuss it. Even if the Widerstände yeah, will be very big in the US, yeah, thank you very much, very big, but we have to put it on agenda because it's worth to discuss it. I wanted to pick up on several things. Um, first, first of all, um, on the claim that that TTIP is an old issues trade agreement I've, I've, or negotiations, I very much disagree because there are so many trade plus issues in there which are actually controversial and which we are talking about. There is something on investment in there which we heard about. There's something on government procurement in there. There's some, something on competition in there which makes it a very much trade plus issue. And I think this is this is what it should be because most of the trade issues aren't just shipping goods from point A to point B anymore, but it's about service it's about digital trade and that involves investment so it is correct to have an investment chapter in there it's something else to discuss then how that should how it should look like what exceptions there should be um, and how dispute settlement should be organized um, but uh, as I said it's, it's very much a trade plus issue um, the second point I wanted to pick up is uh, on the transparency issue um, I really do not <laughs> do not like the claim that there is no transparency at all um, there is quite a bit of information out there, um, and, uh, and I'm sure that Maritje, if she was here, would also say this, that it's a lot more transparency than um, in previous negotiations. The mandates are open, um, available, the positions, position papers are available, and there's much more information than in the past. There are also initiatives um, working from the civil society side, but also supported by governments, which try to work um, on negotiation texts together, where they do um, try to develop how such um, a how such a um, a text could look like in the end. Um, experts, civil society representatives on the internet, and I think that's an excellent idea. Having said this, I still think that there is actually a limit to transparency because you always do have offensive interests and defensive interests. And if you were to put everything into the open, negotiators would not be, I think, be able to make any kind of compromise because they would punish, would be punished by it in the next elections 
Um, and that would be really, I mean, uh, I don't think th they would be able to come to any kind of conclusion at all. So it's not that they are protected against civil society, they are also protected against business interests, several different business interests. And I think there needs to be some closed space where they can make the compromise. Um, one more point, and this is on the, on, on, on the claim, which I've heard so many times now, that um, getting rid of NTBs uh, is about getting rid of regulations, uh, implying that this is a race to the bottom in consumer protection, health protection, environmental protection, and security. And this is not necessarily correct, because a reduction of ta or, or NTBs, what it means is, for example, mutual recognition, what it means is harmonization and joint development of standards. And this can actually be that they, the two partners agree on higher standards. And there's really no evidence within the transatlantic community that there is a race to the bottom on regulations. And I think that's just important to take uh, into consideration. Okay, could I just pick up on that because it's one of my favorite things. So in America, <laughs> in America, you're allowed to wash chickens in chlorine. In Europe, you're not allowed to wash them. So if we have mutual recognition, it means we think, oh, we're going to let the American chlorine wash chickens in Europe even though we don't do it ourselves. So that will mean that the European chicken farmers are at a disadvantage to the mutual recognition. How can you have mutual recognition of contradictory standards? You either have a race to the bottom or the race to the top. I'm happy with the race to the top, but it ain't going to happen, I'm sorry. It's always going to be a race to the bottom, because that's the way the American industry are framing it. If you read their statements, they are saying that. Well, I mean, it, um, there are so, some solutions to this, right? For example, labeling. Half the chicken La washed in chlorine and the other half not. No. Oh, come on. I, I don't think this kind of discussion, <laughs> discussion is worth it, right? I'm sorry, could you give any example how you reconcile those kind of things or genetically modified organisms? How can you have a regulation that allows that and one that doesn't allow it? How well, can you reconcile as, contradictions? As I said, mutual recognition is one way mm. to do it. Another way is um, joint development of standards in, new, te in yeah. new technologies sure. like nanotechnology. Perfect. Another one is, for example, let the consumer decide by labeling. Which they want and to get rid of in TPP is specifically banned from having genetically well, you modified have, you labeling. You do have labeling uh, requirements uh, f for uh, GMOs if I'm not, um, n not, if I'm correct, in California. So well, um, they didn't vote it through. Monsanto spent $40 million fighting it. It's not in there. And they're putting it in TPP it explicitly. Be, you can't still... put labeling. It's forbidden. In, T in TPP. <laughs> it's actually one of the things that's a barrier to trade. It's exactly that. Anyways, it's, it's, it's something which could solve the problem, or with regard to um, hormone beef, um, there was, I think, a, a quite a creative, um, creative solution by um, keeping the restrictions on imports of hormone beef, but increasing the quotas of non-hormone beef. Yeah. So there are some solutions which you could work with, um, and it does not necessarily mean that there needs to be a race to the bottom, that's my point. So, since we are in the middle of a very lively debate right now, um, I would actually open up the panel to the auditorium. We have some more questions prepared, but I know that there are lots of interesting people sitting here who are uh, really waiting to ask you further questions. And uh, I think we have two microphones uh, prepared going around. Who's, ah, one is over there, and I see the first question right in the back. So, and um, as I said right in the beginning, uh, we will follow the Shetham House rules. So, you are allowed and may name your name and institution, but you, are, uh, you do not need to do it if you don't wish so. Could you maybe stand up so we can understand what... Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Johannes Tim. I'm with Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, and I have a question for Glenn Moody just to, to clarify your presentation earlier. You said the two things to focus on is to... Um, get rid of this investor uh, dispute settlement mechanism and to uh, include more transparency in the negotiations. Now, given that uh, those two goals are reached, that we would be successful in, in, in doing that, would you then consider uh, TTIP something worthwhile or is this just a pragmatic fo focus because you don't think um, Preventing the whole thing is an option, so we have to focus on, on what's important. I just wanted to, to get your views on that. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm not against treaties in general. I mean, I think that, you know, if done properly, they're great. 
but I, I do fear that they are being done in the wrong way and that especially the lack of transparency allows that to happen. I mean, you really get the feeling that people have got something to hide. They won't actually tell you what they're doing. They'll only present it at the end when it's too late. So, uh, no, I think it is worth having these discussions. I mean, there's, for example, the tariff barriers, I mean, getting rid of those seems quite sensible because, you know, having those kind of barriers to trade are, you know, obviously an artificial block. But um, it's got to be done the right way. And at the moment, I think it's being bulldozed through somewhat by this 120 billion euros, which, again, even Marietta didn't mention the fact that it was actually if everything goes. So I'd rather a more honest discussion around these things. More questions? So then we continue with uh, our prepare question. I would move on uh, to now TTIP and common standards. So we already heard a few buzzwords. We were talking about uh, genetically modified corn, chlorine-treated chicken, but also data security and the potential allowance of fracking and so forth. Um, so is it really possible for Europe and the US to agree, or to agree on common standards that will improve the situation of its consumers and citizens? Or to put it differently, how could it be avoided that TTIP in the end is just based on the lowest, lowest common denominator, what you already mentioned as well, uh, or simple bargaining power? So that's an open question, uh, whoever wishes to answer. Everybody's thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. So no comments? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there are some areas where we will have huge difficulties coming to an agreement. And I think GMOs is one of them. And I, um, I think there need to be, as I said, um, creative solutions around this. Um, and I don't think there will be a, a joint development on standards with regard to GM, GMOs. Um, what I also uh, wanted to add on the regulation issue is there is this, this stereotype, and I'm also hearing it in, in this discussion, that the EU has always higher standards than the United States. Um, and we haven't heard that buzzword yet, but uh, let's throw it in. The EU is always more precautionary than the United States is. And the EU is always more risk averse than the United States is. And we are more, um, we have a more um, an inclusive approach while you have a more adversary approach. Um, and I think this is, and, and, and this is the explanation for why there will not be any regulatory cooperation. Um, and I think this is wrong. Um, there's a lot of um, empirical uh, analysis, and there's been a huge study, uh, for example, by uh, Wiener and, and others, who looked at several different sectors. Um, and def different risks from health to environment to d including s smoking, drinking, uh, terrorism, and, and so on. And they found that um, the risk preferences and regulatory preferences can change very much over time and are also very different from sector to sector. Um, and I think this is what is going to happen in the negotiations, um, that we do have some sectors in which the EU has higher standards, and in some the US has higher standards, and some it will be more um, difficult, and some it will be easier. But there is nothing like, I would say, a risk or a regulatory culture on both sides of the Atlantic, which is going to um, be a huge impediment for the negotiations. Just a quick follow-up question. You you said like sometimes uh, uh, the one part has uh, higher standards, but how likely likely is it that this will be the benchmark and not like the lower standards? Well, um, the there has also been there have also been a lot of studies on um, the EU as global standard setter. Um, and uh, the EU has been awfully successful in implementing its or getting its higher standards implemented throughout the world. Um, and actually, industry, European industry, does have a large inter huge interest in having higher standards implemented to create a level playing field. So I'm I'm not I, I see the risks obviously, um, but I'm not so worried that there will be a race to the bottom. So, any questions in between from the auditorium? If there are any questions, just, yeah, over there. Um, the microphone is coming. Hello, my name is Annette Mühlberg. I'm from Verdi, and so, obviously, my interest is also in the um, 
bottom race of uh, working conditions and um, co-decision making. And I'm really curious how higher standards will be established in this trade, especially to the right of co-decision making. Can I just um, give a statistic which is quite interesting, which is when the agreement between the US and South Korea was being drawn up, I think there was a promise of a million extra jobs for the US. The actual figure is they lost about three or four hundred thousand. So these predictions that free trade agreements cause this blossoming of employment should be viewed with a certain skepticism, I think. I mean, it's, as I said, it's hard to make predictions about the future, and it's particularly hard in these kind of situations. So I think we need to not just accept that, yes, this is going to be sort of milk and honey for everyone. Another position? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Strengthen the argument before, that was probably one of the last trade deals you saw, and that was still covered uh, with, uh, as it used to be called, Fast Track, or TPA. George W. Bush, still remember him? He was the last one who had this authority, TPA. Obama is thinking about it, getting it. He won't get it. So even that Fast Track deal with South Korea has taken years and years to get it through Congress. That's one issue. The other one is South Korea wasn't happy with that either. But here you should see what IR people would call linkages. Or as a US journalist uh, would put it, the invisible hand of the free market works better with the slightly visible fist in your pocket. So if China hadn't threatened its neighbors among South Korea, South Korea wouldn't have paid tribute to the US by engaging a deal that's not really good for South Korea. Um, I want to return to the subject of ACTA. And um, I want to mention two types of leaked documents. First, from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, where what seems um, that they indicate is that both intellectual property and copyright um, restrictions are, are characterized as excessive. Um, and in the comprehensive economic and trade agreement being negotiated by the EU and Canada, um, we can find entire sections of ACTA copy-pasted, line per line, comma per comma, period per period. So considering this, um, why should we expect from TTIP um, not to have a sort of reenactment of, of ACTA, um, especially if already the EU is pursuing that reenactment with, with CTA. Um, Mr. Bula, since you, you spoke before about ACTA, and I'd like you to address the question. Maybe you, Mr. Rudy, who has had experience with, with ACTA and civil society meetings. Well, <clears throat> I'm also very interested in it. Um, the only thing is that or that I can say is that we should learn from ACTA and again the digital society plays a very big role. It was like um, a very big protest in, in, the, in the internet against these ACTA and it was and, and uh, we, we could see how people can, the civil society can organize against some, some governmental treatments and so what we have to do is, I mean you know, talk with the civil society and, you know, get, well, do discussions like this. I don't have the, the, the key solution for it, but um, as well as far as we, we know that from the ACTA discussion is that nobody talks about it before or just a few groups and it didn't, and there was no big discussions in a civil society. But I don't see a big discussion in the civil society uh, with the TTIP as well. I mean, we are talking here, of very, very good experts here in, in TTIP, even I, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, we just pick a little thing out of it, a digital thing. Well, I mentioned it's bigger than it should be, or it's it's bigger than it um, than it seems to be. But still, I mean, there's some some specialists. We are around 100 people here. I I didn't see the Bill Zeitung writing about the TTIP when Obama was in Berlin. Yeah. So we don't have a big discussion about it because nobody is. Uh, it seems to be there's no 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 issue in the civil society and how how can we solve that? I don't know, but I I do know is that um the that the digital communication systems has to play a role in a transparency way. This, we, I don't have a solution for it, but I'm I'm sure that this is a very big this is one one point for a solution. Yeah. Miguel, you mentioned before the collective ac action problem, and I think that's uh, 
that's valid valid here too that uh, the industry lobbyists are better organized and they, they're able to put forth their message uh, clearly whereas uh, society and uh, the workers movement are then uh, too spread out and uh, well, with apologies to Verdi, uh, badly organized or not organized at all uh, compared to the industry industry lobbyists. So, uh, <laughs> okay. Maybe I can. Uh, but we, well, we have to solve the first problem that we don't have that European society. Huh? So we are discussing in Germany about the the TTIP thing, and this is like a a project on the EU with the US, and it's not a German thing with the US. And, and this is just my personal opinion. But um, since the last twenty years, Germany is very focusing on itself, and we had a very, I mean clearly we we have this reunion. And now there are a lot of mm, themes um, from from internal affairs on the topics, but not on external affairs. So we don't have a really interested uh, society, or we don't have very big topics on on external affairs, and and not on the EU, and and especially not on trade issues. Very very special thing. Yeah, I mean I can make it more more visible for for the consumers if you have like a TV in your home. Yeah, everybody has a TV, and we are talking about connected TV. Another example of the digital age. I'm sorry for that, but I'm here for the for this um, um, thing, well, you have a connected TV, and you pay different taxes for a, for an IT product, and you pay another tax for for consumer electronics. So if you buy a TV, then you have to pay more tax if you buy it from the US than you if you buy a printer or a computer or whatever. This is not, you know, this is, doesn't make any sense. And and try to figure out some points that is is for everybody, and then trying to to begin a debate about these things. Mm -hmm. But um, well, there's uh, there, there are very yeah, it's a very big um, it's a Sisyphus Arbeit we say in German. Yeah, yeah I think you uh, touched on a good point that we should look to see which jurisdiction is responsible. Um, but as, as we as we as we mentioned before, the, if the intelligence services are to be subjected to better uh, to better to better control, then that's a national security issue. And that belongs on the level of the member state, or, or maybe on the level of the European Council. Uh, the, the the European Commission has a competency in trade policy, so the trade negotiations are bound to be done on the European level. But if there is to be action against uh, uh, insufficient control of one's intelligence services, then that has to go down to the member state level. That would be something that uh, Germany could con concern itself with. If I may pick up on, on, on this issue, after the NSA scandal, um, the transatlantic partners got to kind of got together and talked about how, how, how they could resolve this issue. Um, and there was a proposal to have two working groups, um, EU US working group, one, one on data privacy and one actually on espionage issues and, and, and the NSA. Um, and um, the former one, the data privacy issue, is actually includes the EU um, institutions, the member states, but it's a very much an EU-US negotiation forum. Um, and they talked about if they should do this also with regard to the second issue. And they decided, the EU member states decided they didn't want this. Right? They rather preferred bilateral negotiations with the United States um, because, um, uh, well, the secret services are also working together on a bilateral level. Um, the EU member states are not sharing all the information they have with each, I mean, with each other. Um, and obviously, um, this, and, and uh, I heard this earlier before, and I very much agree, this undermines the negotiation power of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, of, of the EU vis-a-vis -vis the United States. So I think to, to have um, the necessary power to come to, to an agreement on this issue, the EU member states need to agree on how they want to, to regulate um, data privacy, but also um, how to cooperate um, amongst uh, uh, secret service and to regulate secret service among each other. And then they can actually um, uh, negotiate with the United States on a more eye to eye level. Um, mm. Plus, what's also problematic with this approach of bilateral negotiations, it's a, it's a perfect entry point for US negotiators to kind of um, uh, uh, bring bring the uh, EU member states apart, so they will pick and choose with whom they want to cooperate. I mean, it's an it's an obvious tactic in any kind of negotiations, but it's a, it's a perfect entry point, um, and it's kind of, it's a little bit our own fault that we are mm -hmm. offering this. Yeah, just okay. examples where that happens is Port Security Initiative. 
remember still George W. Bush. You know, they had this forward defense, so don't don't examine the containers on U.S. soil. Uh, if they blow up, we have a problem. Do that in Hamburg and other states here in Europe. Some. Uh, had a problem with that, uh, the youth, for example, the commission and, and uh, you levels, but you know, they, they, they did my divide emperor, divide and conquer. Mm. And they got it. Same with this name passenger record data. And here, that would be a question. The parliament, and I heard the parliament uh, is kind of uh, getting more and more important than, than self confident, had big issues with this name passenger record. Passenger name record data. When we fly, we, we, we give away some data. Uh, they finally agreed, but it took a, a long time. Now, mm -hmm. with this NSA scan, uh, will they be even more confrontative and will that be one of the sticking points in this trade deal? That's something, mm -hmm. the question open in my mind, and maybe the experts can help me here. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid that slowly but surely we have to come to an end. I just uh, would like to ask one quick question if there are no additional questions from the auditorium. Just a quick look around. Um, so since, uh, yeah, uh, just one last question was already mentioned uh, before, but um, to specify it, um, who would you say, and I would like to have everyone saying, just um, pointing it out in one short sentence, um, cui bono, uh, who benefits really from TTIP on both sides of the Atlantic? Is it the unemployed youth in Spain, former car industry workers in Detroit, or bankers in Wall Street and the city of London? So just to, to have it like a kind of, to have like one last provocative statement, I would uh, invite you to everyone have like one last say on that. Um, I, I'd just like to point out something that we've left, left out thus far. Um, uh, I see the TTIP negotiations as a as a second best. You have to remember that we've been going on for I don't know 12 or 14 years now with negotiations that were called the Doha Development Agenda, and at the at the WTO in in the in the in the in the context of the World Trade Organization, those would have been uh, more desirable than a plurilateral agreement between the United States and the European Union. Uh, not only would they have eliminated non-tariff barriers. But also subsidies could could have been uh, eliminated at that level. So we we have to see TTIP as the second best alternative because the Doha development round failed. If I may pick up exactly on this, I very much agree. I would have uh, preferred the Doha round to be concluded. Um, but since this is uh, very unlikely to happen in Bali at the ministerial meeting, the TTIP is what we've got. So, and and it is going to be it is negotiated. So what we have to do is make sure that this that um, the negotiation text and the agreement in the end is going going to be beneficial not just to the EU and the US but um, to third countries as well. So I think it needs to be. Um, compatible to WTO rules. Mm -hmm. That's very, very important. It's need, it needs to be open for other members um, if they would like uh, to join. It, it, um, it should not increase the spaghetti bowl of different uh, rules of origin and different standards. So there should be a um, a kind of standardization or at least um, we need to be very careful not to have any kind of contradictory rules. And I think in point of not undermining the WTO, I think it's important to still use the WTO dispute settlement procedure and not try to solve all of our conflicts um, on a bilateral um, level. Thank you. Your question was who benefits? Exactly. I see those who benefit <laughs> from the... <laughs> from the... Yeah, just to... to <laughs> I, I see the beneficiaries of the current situation. And knowing the political system as a ex-participant observant, I know how well organized they are. Therefore, we won't see a change. We may have TTIP, but it's really small, mm -hmm. little. It won't change a much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tiny TTIP, maybe TTIP. Yeah. Tip, <laughs> tip, a tip. <laughs> oh, the question was the unemployment Spanish. Um, yeah. yeah the worker. Well, I hope it will be the worker uh, working in the industrial internet automotive fabric here in Germany and um, yeah so this is what we are working for yeah 
I, uh, sorry for dodging the question, but I would like to go back to what the presentations earlier talked about, and that was the Internet being a global space that the national state can no longer control. And actually TTIP and international trade agreements are a way of extending our rules and regulations to the global level on which the Internet works. Mm -hmm. And we actually need those kinds of agreements. And what, what's really a failure of TTIP is something that Joachim mentioned earlier, that we are not talking enough about the ICT industry, that we are not talking about that services are sold globally and cross-nationally above, uh, above the Internet, and what kind of standards we want to have for those services. I mean, it's going on at the moment, and we have a poor regulatory framework for it. Mm -hmm. And we actually have a chance to think positively, how should a, a transnational framework for a global internet economy look like, and then make that the center of TTIP um, negotiations, and in that, that regard, I agree, it's, it's, it's actually a, a huge missed opportunity, that because it's backward looking, it looks at all these old industries uh, and old issues that we probably won't resolve, instead of the issues that are really transnational and that we need to discuss because we need regulatory frameworks that are not sufficiently included and therefore I think we are all, all of us as internet users and internet service providers, we are all losers in that regard that if we don't change the debate in terms of including that and having the debate more forward looking than, than backward looking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What he said, uh, I think that without all the internet stuff this is actually fundamentally misguided because it's really talking about a lot of things that um, are from the past, important that they are, but without that kind of reference, we're missing so much. That also addresses issues to do with transparency, because once you start bringing the internet into it, you can start talking about the diffusion of information. It also addresses surveillance, because this surveillance has come about because of the internet, let's remember. This kind of surveillance wasn't really an issue 20 years ago, because there wasn't the internet. And so I'd say that without the internet, and without transparency, and with ISDS, then it's certainly going to be the, the status quo, it's going to be the big mm -hmm. companies, and it's not going to be the, the unemployed youth in Spain, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the panelists earned themselves a big round of applause, and I uh, thank you all for the, all the insights. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I do not want to stop the debate right now. I think the debate just gets started, and we can also extend it. And what we are um, now uh, providing outside is uh, some wine, pretzels, and also, as I heard, beer. Uh, so feel free to continue. Yeah, exactly. Feel free to continue the talks. And uh, thank you very much uh, for a great event.